So may I first request now, Professor Guho to kindly present his plan. And discussions may follow if we have time. So I think Hugh is going to be a... Um, Roland and Jean-Michel Bécon. The quest for a new space. It's going to be a very different kind of paper. Not zero diet, heavy in uh, the truckloads of information. It's going to be a very different kind of interface. Uh, now, um, I'm very happy that uh, I'm sharing this session with one of the great scholars, of, two of the great scholars of time, Professor Jean-Michel and Professor Rafa Nabasu. And I think it will serve as the right background for my presentation. Now, we all know, everybody knows, everybody who enters the Ram Krishna Mission Institute of Culture every day and elsewhere, uh, that uh, Romain Roland wrote uh, the biography of Sri Ram Krishna Mission Institute And we take it easy. We take it easy. Of He's such a great man, and his master. Then it's not really natural for Romain Roland, whoever he may be, to write a biography. Can you understand the implications of this impossible project at a crucial point of time in history? Very, very important. And if you do that, I think we have failed to understand the importance of such an impossible project at a crucial point of time, as I said, in history. It's as important as Max Muller's. Uh, uh, reactions to this uh, great flowering of thought. Now, uh, as busters crumble and beams crack all around us in this new century, we wistfully recall a near forgotten dialogue between Romain Roland and a few children of the Indian Renaissance. Tibor, Gandhi, I would say, Sri Ram Krishna and Shami Vivekananda. As he opened the magic cascade of the newly, nearly forgotten correspondence and the biographies of the 20s and 30s, disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves, to go to it, it offers a scenario for humanity so significantly different from the one we have been able to enact. It was a fascinating this biography, this whole project of two biographies, <coughs> three biographies for that matter. Do we know that Roland's biography of Gandhiji was the first <coughs> in the West, 1924? And to Roland, to Gandhi himself, he is confessing many times that he wanted to live up to the expectations of this great biography, as he wrote to the Rishi, Roland. Now, it was a fascinating cross-cultural encounter. Let's try to understand this in this moment of crisis in the world. Where despite the globalization, everything is falling apart. And we've been only build, able to build islands instead of bridges. It was a kind of fireside conversation with two persons who are not present, Sri Ramakrishna and Shami Vega. It was an interface between two streams of thought, two historical and cultural discourses. It was a common shared space. We know how difficult it is to do that from France or Switzerland. Roland never came to India, as you all know. And uh, although he wrote three of the best biographies on Indians in the last century. And even the name of Roland Is it has become irrelevant. When we were children, our parents told us that you must read Jean Christophe. And I discovered a copy of Jean Christophe when I was two and a half years old in my father's library. Jean Cobosh told me that for his generation it was un unpardonable if they hadn't read La Manchante, Enchanted Soul, and Jean Christophe. But now I go to College Street, you ransack the library to Calcutta. You come to Jalapur University, you hear the cause of Foucault and Derrida, but Romain Roland has disappeared from this planet. Why? Who is this man? In France, I've heard the word 
expression. Qui c'est Romain Roland? Who is this Romain Roland? Just begin by saying who this man is. Who is this man whose biographies are available in the uh, sales counter of the Institute of Culture? Who is he? Is he a ghost? Does he mean anything to us at this point of time? He was a novelist, translated into 36 languages. 43 volumes of Romain Roland's complete works in Japanese. Now, Kaname Nakamura told me there are 16 editions of his 43 volume complete work. Same in China, still in Germany, still in Sweden, still in many parts of the world. Who is this man? Ubergine! to our space to write these excellent things. <coughs> these are not hegeographies. He starts with a magnifying glass. He puts them under a scanner. How does he do it? And why? Novelist Pierrot is famous for his Le Théâtre de la Révolution, Theatre of the French Revolution. Musicologist, biographer, how many biographies did you write? Only the biographies of Gandhiji, Ramakrishna, and Vivekananda? No. Ten biographies. He is the biographer of Beethoven in France. He is the biographer of Michelangelo in France, which was published last year again, printed again. He is the biographer of Handel. He is the biographer of the Impressionist painter Mie. He is the biographer of Tolso in French. And Tolso corresponded with, corresponded with only, only, only one 20th century writer. Six letters. And it is This man, 60 volumes of letters. Not to be, we shouldn't believe that he wrote letters only to Gandhiji and, 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 and uh, even Rabindranath. He wrote letters to all some of the greatest thinkers of the planet. How did you move into our space? Why at that point of time? Now, this man was born in January. 1866 in France, five years after the birth of Tigor, three years before the birth of Gandhiji and the opening of the Suez Canal, and five years before the Third Republic in France. And as we know, the same decade as Charles Vivekananda, Roland, and Vivekananda. Now, this Nobel laureate, Roland, 1915. Let's know the background, Romain Roulon, secretly donated all his prize money to the Red Cross. Although he had a motor accident in 1910 and needed to go to the nursing home every month and had not a single person. This is the background. This is the kind of man who would write to our most illuminating biographies of the century from another part of the globe. Now, this winner of Grand Prix de l'Académie Française, two doctoral theses in the regions of modern lyrical theater and history of opera, member of the prestigious École Française de Rome, professor of history of art at École Normale Supérieure, where I studied Jean Paul Sartre, and Rolla Bart, and David. Rola also belonged to that crème de la crème of France. Professor of music at École des Hautes Études of Music. At Collège de France, the highest institution in the hexagon. Author of Jean Christophe, possibly one of the most widely read French novels of the last century. Prospective member of Académie Française. Suddenly in Cœur de Roth of the French intelligentsia after he wrote a pacific pamphlet, pacifist pamphlet called Au-dessus de la Vélée, above the Spall, in 1915, immediately after his Nobel Prize, and was wiped out from his country. He had advised his fellow countrymen, very important for us, to rise above their nationalism, reject the war, and was immediately castigated as vendu, traite, colère, sold out, traitor, renegade. Even as the whole world 
He was, a, even if uh, he was at all in other parts of the world, as a great free-willed humanist. Let's know who he is going to write the biographies. Who is this man? So this man cast again in his own country for find, trying to find the world in his own country. To, for crossing the borders, for questioning the frontiers. Like Robin Ronald did in 1916 at the Imperial University of Tokyo. And then, he said, my single silence would have ensured in France all the triumphs to which the vanity of an artist can aspire. aspire. Even if some of his chicken-hearted compatriots left him in the lodge, and others like Henri Massis published books like Romain Roland against France, he earned new friends across the borders, like Robin Jean of Tagore, Mahatma Gandhi, Maxime Gorky, Hermann Hesse, Stephen Zweig, Bertrand Russell, Albert Einstein, Albert Schweitzer, Sigmund Freud. And gradually in France, Du Abel, Pierre Jean Jouve, Argo, and Malone. So in 1922, Romain Roulanceau, seven, eight years before his biographies of Jean Christian Vivekanando, Romain Roland, Nobel laureate, Academie Francaise, member of Academie Francaise, would forsake Paris in great disgust and go to live in Villa Olga in Villeneuve, Switzerland, near the Geneva Lake, for 15 years, moving, in his words, to Tagore from the vortex of men to the heart of man. Du turbillon des hommes au cœur de l'homme. Deeply shaken by the First World War and the stream of faith generated by nationalism, he moved instinctively into the Indian space for sustenance and light. Like his two idols, Beethoven and Goethe, he was always interested in, in India, the beehive of its ancient mind. As Professor Murti referred to us just now. Let's not forget that. Huh? Let's not sort of behave ourselves and think and, uh, and uh, gloat in uh, the present civilization of uh, globalization. Now, uh, he moved instinctively into the Indian space for sustenance and light. And he was reading, believe, just a man, he, you see, he was a student of Ecole Normale Superior, of Ecole Francis de Rome, a friend of Nietzsche's friend, Malvida Melvesenberg. Such a person was reading Gita and he said, My God, my God. He was not a religious man, he was not a spiritualist. He was, in, he was a European rationalist, a student of Ernest Rodin and Victor Hugo. And he opened the guitar and said, My God, my God, c'est un volcan, it is a volcano. Le guitar, c'est un volcan. And then his friend Cosette Padou was going to India in 1908 and he wrote to Cosette Padou, Tell the art, the water and the air, the author of Jean Christophe wrote to Cosette Badou, tell the earth, the water and the air, Romain Roland salutes India. Twenty years before the biographies were written. Maybe I shall go there one day, in this life or another. But it's only after the disaster of the First World War that he turned squarely towards India, our mother. Learn de notre mère. A letter to Dr. Kali Vajnag, 12 November 1922. He was afraid of dying before he explored those higher horizons. We've been under the British Empire for such a long time. How many Western, I teach English literature in Calcutta University. I can assure you with complete honesty that no English writer would even ever dare to write something like this. None of them. But he's somebody from the other space, from another space, was responding to the echoes and cross references from this land in a moment of crisis. And Roland was afraid of dying before he explored these higher horizons. He thought he at last he wrote in many languages, spoke in many languages, Italian and German. He listened to Beethoven all the time, wrote letters to Tolstoy to which Tolstoy responded. Such a man said, 
he had at last found the key to the garden of happiness, India. Je crois à ces déclarations, je me suis trompé de maison. I believe that in this incarnation, I've mistaken my house. Roland uh, signed, it's very important for us to know that what, what the, who the man is, because I have a feeling that very few people in India, my students for example, don't know that he's not only the biographer of Rossi Ramakrishna Vivekananda, but he's also the biographer of, of Michelangelo or Handel, or he wrote uh, five novels of international, highest international standard, translated in at least 36 languages, and uh, still very, very popular in very, very part, many parts of the globe. And then, both of them, uh, they do, did not know each other, wrote Tagore. This is very interesting for us. Roland won the Nobel Prize in 1915. Tagore in 1913. No, there was no Nobel Prize in 14 because of the First World War. So, unconsciously, they met, they were on the same wavelength. It's a conspiracy of history. They did not know each other. Tagore was reading Jean Christophe in Calcutta. And Roland was noting down Tigo's lectures, nationalism lectures, in faraway Switzerland, in his notebook. And Roland wrote about Tigor when Tigor was talking about crossing the borders. Let's not forget that this great cross-bordering is best exemplified in the biographies of Shiram Krishna Bhikkhan, written from that far corner. Now, um, Roland wrote in 1916 about Tigor. No British writer would write this. No American writer would write this. And he said, C'est un tournant dans l'histoire de l'humanité. It's a turning point. Tagore's lectures of cross bordering of internationalism, is a turning point in the history of humanity. He writes down in his diary. And then, very interestingly, before I move on to my, the, the, the crux of the matter, uh, Roland and Tagore, without knowing each other, along with, along with uh, others like Barton Russell and Albert Schweitzer and Stephen Zweig, signed in 1919, right after the Jalian Wallabog massacre, signed La Déclaration de l'Indépendance de l'Esprit, the Declaration of Independence of the Mind. Muktomoner Shankar Matra. We all know about the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. But do we know about this excellent piece signed by people from across the group? And it's called Declaration of the Independence of the Mind. And then it all started. They're all, for example, we all know that Robert Renard wrote to his, uh, to his son that it's time to move out. Shantatik Shankit Nodat Juk He said, Insert the days of the era of nationalistic insularity is over. The first beginning of the global fraternity of the future will be seen in the greens of Bolpur. Whether that failed, whether that's another disaster, that's another story. But then it happened. And Roland was now, with already written biographies, he was looking for a man, quest for a man who can who can help us to solve the puzzle of existence. He was, he was turning towards Gandhiji very, very slowly. He wrote to Kalinash Nang, D'aucun poète et passeur de l'Europe actuelle, je ne me sens plus proche que de lui. J'ai été frappé de la parenté de la pensée indienne avec celle des plus grandes âmes de la Grèce. Very interesting. He said, I was struck by the closeness of Indian thought with the greatest minds of Greece or of eternal Europe which have nourished me. The only difference, I believe, is that Indian philosophy is more substantial. They thought, they thought the same things, but India had greater depth and completeness, and it's coached in a more splendid form. Depth and magnitude are distinctive of Indian genius, but we seem to have thought the same things. Nous avons pensé la même chose. We seem to have thought the same things. This is very interesting. It was our thought. He underlines our. C'est notre pensée. It's an homage. We need to have a of the Raro Halukuri Virgin. You have thought it much better. Much more profound. Much more multi-layered Indian thought. Yes. But we 
or I will survive in the same way for the humanization of history. So it's our thought. This was part of Roman Hollande's search for new gods and a new humanity. The time is savage and cruel, he said, full of devastations. <laughs> Yet it is powerful. It destroys, it renews. We have to struggle against ancient ideals. We have to struggle against a dying god. Against millions of eyeless minds. The blind minds. Nous avons affronté des dieux nouveaux et une nouvelle humanité. This is part of the project of the 20s. We have to establish new gods and a new humanity. I think this echoes shall be living on. It's time to find found new humanity. Il n'y a aucune raison de penser que l'homme nouveau soit de préférence européen. There is no earthly reason, says Romain Roland in 1920s, early 20s, to believe that the new man is a European, is a white man. I believe he comes from India. <coughs> or from perhaps <coughs> even from China. He said that. Now, Romain Roland was the first. He was a novelist, he was a playwright. He wrote many plays about the French Revolution. I translated myself, Danton, from French into Bengali. And while translating uh, a display about the French Revolution, I was tearing my hair. It seemed to me that I was watching a current clipping on what is going on in India now. He contemporizes this. It's our problem. The problem of French Revolution is a problem of, say, every important uh, uh, movement in any part of the world. He knows, he, he draws out the, the relevance of it. He says, books which remain books, which remain imprisoned in the libraries, are like abortion. It doesn't help anyone. It's never to It must lead to something new, a renewal of ourselves. If it does not, I'm ready to go away. And he said, and so, so he was the first to develop the, I, I, the writing of biographies among the major writers in the West, in the six, seven languages that I speak and write, and I show with complete honesty, I don't know anyone, any great writer, any great novelist who could, who even thought of writing a biography like this. He read every part of the world. Every issue, every single writing by Gerhard von Rochein to understand So this is a kind of research work which remains uh, elusive in our times. We talk, have tall talks everywhere about you know, global dialogues. Now, now this man, he was the first to develop the writing of biographies into a form of art. He was not interested in the biographies which tell nothing about, but the objective truth which are liable to uh, be mere books of reference. Romain Roland attempted in all his biographies to combine truth and fiction of objective analysis and biographer's own personal perception. Now, what happened after he wrote the biography of Gandhi, as I told you just now, if you can look into the biography, and the correspondence of Gandhiji and Ramahola in the sea, that Ramahola Gandhiji you know, went on saying for decades, even after his death in 1944, Ramahola's death, that he had always tried to be to, of the same level. He always tried to live up to the expectations of what Roland wrote in 1924 in the book published by Stuck and Ganesan in India. Now, it's important to remember that Roland came to know Sri Ramakrishna and Shami Vivekananda in the midst of a great crisis. It did not start just like that. There was a crisis, the biggest crisis in Roland's dialogue with India. That was in 1926, when we all know Tagore, after his visit to Italy, and after his encounter with Mussolini, came to meet Roman Roland in Villeneuve. And there was a crisis. The book has not been translated into English, his India Diary. And perhaps some of you can finally look at my book, The Tower and the Sea, published by Shaita Academy. The crisis. It was a disaster. And Tigor, it is not just 
an encounter between Chigur and Mussolini it was something which really uh, led to many misunderstandings in the West and maybe the first beginning of Chigur's decline in the West. And there are ample proofs and examples of the misunderstandings which, was provoked, which were provoked by this L'Affaire Mussolini. I'm not going to that. In the same letter, when Romain Roland erupted like a volcano against Rabindranath Tagore, and about the rumor that Tagore had rallied around Mussolini, whom he had compared confidentially with the Raja of his own place, or with Alexander the Great, or Napoleon. He, maybe he couldn't understand. He admitted in the same letter, in September 1926, when he was lambasting those who attacked Tagore in the West, even his friends, he admitted that his sister, Madeleine Roland, who knew English, was reading Dhangopal Mukherjee's book, The Face of Silence. Dhangopal Mukherjee visited Romain Roland on 4th October 1926. A 36-year-old man would commit suicide in 10 years' time. The Face of Silence. The earlier day, Rola had no knowledge about Sri Ramakrishna and Shami Mirikam. Not much. So, that was the beginning. <coughs> and then, a year later, on 30th May 1920, 30th May, 30th May 1927, on the day Miss MacLeod visited Roma Rola in Villeneuve, Switzerland, Roma Rola wrote in his diary, Voici plusieurs mois, presque une année, à la suite de la visite de M. Mukherjee, que nous sommes attirés, ma sœur et moi, par les personnalités presque mythiques de Siram, Krishna et de Vivekananda. For several months, almost a year, since the visit of Tan Gopal Mukherjee, we are attracted, my sister and me, towards these mythical personalities, Siram, of Siram, Krishna and Vivekananda. <coughs> Mukherjee put us into relation, this is very important for practical details of biography, put us in relationship, and sort of give us contacts of the Ram Krishna Mission. Already in 1926. And through Miss McLeod, Ram Krishna Mission sent a whole library of books in 1926 to Romain Nobel laureate, biographer of Tolstoy, Michelangelo, and Beethoven. Now turning towards India for light. Because, why did he do it? Because l'Europe don't come in Pierre. Europe is falling down, falling down, falling down. Remember? The London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. TSA, the Christmas. Europe is falling down, falling down, falling down like a stone. You have to only look towards this great behind of mind, ancient mind, comes India. And then, he said, we got the biographies, and every day, his sister, this is fantastic, do you, I hope, I mean, you are all great scholars, uh, this is for your information, and many of you, I'm sure, uh, already know it, Rabbi Ola did not know English. He did not know English. Not a single word. And uh, uh, all this was possible. Can you imagine this great project? He wrote all this in far away uh, Switzerland without knowing the language. We still speak, I think, 1,500 languages in this country. Uh, not dialects, but languages, according to Manorama in your book. Now, uh, so they were reading every day, the sister translating, just look at this impossible project, Madeleine Roland, who's, who learned Bengali from Rubindranath Tagore. Uh, who became his teacher, our teacher, was reading, translating, instant interpretation. How difficult it may be. We have all, all forgotten Madeleine Roland, this unmarried sister of Omar Roland, who made possible this great intercultural bridge with Gandhiji, Vivekananda, with Sri Krishna, and with Dumitranath, with Shubhash Chandra Bosch, with Nehru. Now, what was going on? The, 
they, they were reading every day. Remember, Rola was not inactive. He was writing his great masterpiece, Enchanted Soul. He was writing his great plays, Le Triomphe de la Raison, The Triumph of Reason. He was writing his great plays. He was writing Robespierre, his masterpiece. He was, he was rewriting Beethoven's biography for the third time. And yet, he found time to do this impossible thing. And Miss Medloud spoke to Roland about Shamiji in, in America, England, and India three months before his death in 1902. She also spoke about Sister Nivedita and his visit. And this visit by MacLeod and Angobal Mukherjee lighted a thousand candles in Villa Olga near Geneva Lake in Switzerland. Even now it's difficult for us. I tried to go and did go, but even now it's so difficult to go there. I know how. The whole of India, Rajendra Prasad, Anandola Shankar Rai, Ramananda Chatterjee, Jawadi Shankar Bosch, Rubin Narath several times, Gandhiji, they all went to meet this man from another space, an alternative space, not a British space. And this was happening all the time. And so what happened? And then this great experiment of twin biographies was triggered off. Suddenly, Roland stopped writing his great novel and said, time to unlock this great world. And then he, you'll find one of the longest entries about India in Roman Roland's diaries on 13th and 14th May 1927, which is available in uh, the great uh, diary I'm translated and by Romain Roland. Uh, it's the longest century uh, of 20 pages on Sirach Krishna Shami And then it all started. Uh, as Romain Roland embarked on the great project, he wrote to Kali Vashnag, I shall take with me my notes and documents to complete my Bibi Kanundo. It's a, it's, a it's a long and difficult work. He wrote in French, this is my translation. Even more so because I want to sum up in my own European way the conceptions so complex of the two masters who synthesize in their dazzling incarnations the beehive of the thousand year old mind of India, the divine polyphony which has made possible that Advaitic unity. And it is in this metaphysics that I find the fulfillment of my deepest and innate instincts, the deeply moving heroic beauty of Shami Vivekananda's speeches and of Ram Krishna's Kathamrita are so lively that their tornado can sweep away the worms like wisps of straw. Rula was not a geographer. He was always putting under a scanner and he did lambast somebody. For example, in, if, you, if some of you uh, look up biography of Ram Krishna, in the first page he criticizes the photographs. He says there is something seriously wrong with the photographs. Uh, it cannot be an authentic one. And he, he called out the finest photographers of the West and they all said there is something wrong with the photograph. Uh, he describes Gandhi's nose, his ears. And he, he's a man who, who starts from the base. And this is very, very interesting. And he does so with Vivekananda too. Uh, and Sri Ram Krishna too. And, uh, and, of course, he, he makes his own kind of criticism because he, I told you once again, again and again, that he was not a spiritualist. But to Romain Roland, with his lion's heart, <coughs> Shinko Ridoi, Vivekananda, who was a spirit with widest wings, who could attain his heights by several <coughs> flights and tempests, who reminded him over and again, over again, of Beethoven. Vivekananda and Beethoven. Roland and Raphael. Sorry, Ram Krishna and Raphael and Mozart. Now, even in the moments of rest upon its bosom, the sails of Ibikanando's ships were filled with every wind that blew. Artly cries, the sufferings of ages, fluttered round him like a flight of famished gulls. All of you will remember that in the first page of Ibikanando's biography by Roland, there's a reference to the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. And uh, the reference to Schiller's Ode to Joy. For him, Vivekananda was energy personified, and action was his message to men. For him, as for Beethoven, it was the root of all virtues. As a European, Roland began with a very, this is very important, because you can't start from 
the air. He starts with the physical description of Swamiji. He had done the same in the case of Gandhiji as Sri Krishna. Very, very interesting. You sort of call the reader. The reader starts sort of feeling this man, feeling him, and uh, then move into the intellectual space and the emotional space. And Swami becomes those you know, tall, five feet, eight and a half inches frame, square, square shouldered, broad chested, stout frame, with muscular arms, olive complexion, full face, vast forehead, uh, strong jaw, magnificent eyes, large, dark, and prominent with heavy leads. His commanding presence, his strength and beauty, the baritone voice. The baritone voice. The voice matter at Chicago. It's a voice. The moment we start speaking, it's not only the ex wonderful expression, universal expression, brothers and sisters of America. It's also the voice. The music of the voice. And he research on the voice. It was, he was not imagining things. He tried to understand the implications of the great victory of this man at a particular point of time in history. And he said, mm, his commanding presence, his strength and beauty, the grace and dignity of his being, the splendid music of his rich, deep voice, it was like a violoncello. Remember, Roland was a professor of music at Ecole, Ecole Francaise and Sorbonne. This he had learned from Mrs. Magloud, Miss Magloud. And Roma, Roma Roland was describing the brain of this man, who was a doer. The synthesis of his great opposing forces took years of struggle, according to him, consuming Vivekananda's daily life, but the flame of his pyre is still alive today from his ashes, says Ronald Bilbando, like those of the phoenix of old has sprung in the conscience of India. And he uses a fantastic word, the arrow of Vivekananda, or deer. He remembered, he, he, according to him, as Rothnadi tried to uh, say so many words, Vivekananda remained flesh and bones. Starts from the ground floor. Very, very important. Although absolute detachment beneath the heights of Ivikanandu's mind, he says, the rest of his body remained immersed in life and action. His whole edifice bears this double impress. The basement is a nursery of apostles of truth and social service who mix in the life of the people and the movement of the times. But the summit is the Ara Maxima, the lantern of the dawn, the, the, the spire of the cathedral, the ashrama of all ashramas, the Advaita built in the Himalayas, when the two hemispheres, the west and the east, we're talking about Prachu and Prachatu, one of the most beautiful travelogues I've ever read in my life, and of course, Puri Prachu, um, meet at the confluence of all mankind in absolute unity. If Roland repeatedly calls Sri Ramakrishna a Mozartian symphony, he knew that it was Shami Vivekananda who set out to build the Sita State, the city of mankind, on the foundation of the gold on the golden concrete of symphony. When Gandhiji came to see Roland in his house in Switzerland, it's very interesting. Roland raised the question of Shami Vivekananda. And he said, Do you understand? Mr. Gandhi, that your true predecessor, Shami Vivekananda, the destitutes, the untouchables, the ordinary men. Gandhi was like embarrassed. And he said that he had, in fact, gone to meet Ramakrishna, sorry, Shami Vivekananda on his return from South Africa, but Shamiji was not there. Later, on 6 January 1933, Gandhi wrote to Madeleine. Gandhi wrote to Madeleine, Roland's sister, please tell the Rishi, your brother, Roland, that some months ago, I read for the first time his volume, Some Sira of Krishna Shami Vivekananda. The reading gave me great joy and enabled me more fully to more fully understand myself. In 1934, when Gandhiji was ill-treated by the British, this is in his diary, Roman Roland said, Oof, if only Shami Vivekananda, with his razor-sharp irony, were in India at this time. It is regrettable, writes Roland, that the name and the words of Shami Vivekananda has not been invoked as often 
as he would have wished in the writings of Dante and his disciples. Although Rolla did uh, admit that Gandhiji uh, went on pilgrimage with Kosturba to Belur for Shamiji's birth anniversary festival in January 1927. The tenacious, he says, the tenacious and unwavering moderation of Gandhiji's action is mixed with politics and sometimes becomes, uh, but Vivekananda's heroic passion rejects politics of all kinds, which he seems to admire. Now, uh, of course, it's not a value judgment, but it's a very interesting reflection by a biographer of both these great sages. We're about to finish. The last few minutes. In the splintered map of this new century, Romain Roland, the world citizen, has no room of his own. He's not even recognized in France, where he was member of Académie Française. Why? Because in 1914, during the war, when France had a lot of stakes in the First World War, he rejected the war, like Louis uh, in, in, in the splintered map, he has no place. This dialogue with Romain Roland, I will say it's a dialogue between Romain Roland and Gandhi G, and Sri Ramakrishna and Shanti Vivekananda, was not a meeting between the mythical East and the mythical waste, nor was it an encounter with the proverbial other. Roland, whose thoughtful respect and empathy for India separated him from many of the suave cultural imperialists of the West, clearly disrupted the Orientalist desire, the discourse of desire and mythification, which has merely corroded the texts of most Westerners, leading to a serious falsification of human history. This was not a chance encounter across the frontiers, nor was it an artificial cosmetic discourse. One can discern drops of a real tear, like the rarest of pearls, strewn all over this interface. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very brilliant and powerful presentation. I wish it could continue for some time more. But if we were late with the site target, the clock is against us. So I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and patient hearing. In this session, we listened to two brilliant papers on comparison of Swamiji's ideas with two Western minds of Europe, one from Germany, British Max Muller, and another from France, Roma Rola. Now, the last academic session will be coming. Thank you.